China is an exception and it is an exception. And please notice, I said China, C-H-I-N-A. There is a phrase, war by other means. Hmm. There is also, think of it, this is politics by another means. So who sent the Indian army to the LAC? Rahul Gandhi didn't send them. Narendra Modi sent them. Look at the hypersensitivity of the, of the media. You know, look how people jumped up and down when Article 370 was, was uh, you know, uh, decided yeah. upon. Namaste Jai Hind. Welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Today, my guest is India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar. An illustrious career of 38 years as diplomat, Dr. Jai Shankar was India's ambassador in China, the Czech Republic, USA, Singapore and then finally Foreign Secretary. He was picked up by Prime Minister Modi to be part of his cabinet in 2019 as External Affairs Minister. The articulate Dr. Jai Shankar is my guest today. Dr. Jai Shankar, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. You know, every podcast that I've done, uh, the comment section is filled with, when are you getting Dr. Jai Shankar? When are you getting Dr. Jai Shankar? So today I'm really that, that's happy. That's me commenting. That, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't believe one word of that. <laughs> so now I'm so glad and my team is thrilled that you're here with us today. And it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I am going to get into the macro issues of policy matters and, and uh, you know, India's neighborhood and all in the second half of the podcast. Okay. The first half is basically a curation of all that I've been seeing on the comments section where people said, please ask Dr. Jay Shankar this. So um, the, the question which most people had was that how did the transition take place from, you know, being a bureaucrat, a career diplomat, to becoming a politician, joining Mr. Modi's cabinet? Mm -hmm. How did you make that transition? What tools did you employ? Well, uh, I didn't make the transition. It happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, it happened because, uh, as you know, I come from a bureaucratic family. Uh, we don't have anybody remotely in the family who's entered politics in any party at any time. Uh, it had not crossed my mind. I don't think it had crossed the mind of anybody else in my circle. And uh, then, uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, what happened in May of 2019 happened. Now, uh, once I entered, I must say, in all honesty, I, I myself was very unsure. I mean, I had watched politicians all my life. Hmm. You know, one of the things you get to do in the Foreign Service, by the way, is you actually perhaps much more than other services. You see politicians up close because you see them abroad. You're, you know, you're kind of uh, working with them closely. You're counseling them. So, so it's one thing to watch, uh, but uh, to actually join politics, to, uh, to, to become a cabinet member, to stand for Rajya Sabha. Because, you know, when I was selected, I was not even a member of parliament. Uh, so... Each of this kind of happened one by one. I uh, slid into it sometimes without knowing it. You learnt by watching others. That's something, you know, uh, we say sometimes you, you go to uh, to any foreign environment, you kind of, you, you pick up by... So for me, this wasn't a foreign environment, but it was a different environment. So, you know, uh, you looked at others, more senior people, more experienced people in the cabinet, in the party, in other parties... I mean, mm. uh, I even today, you just uh, see, watch me in parliament. I do follow a lot. I, I look very carefully at what uh, people are doing, both in my own party and other parties. I think there's a lot to learn from everybody. So you get into it step by step. Sometimes you surprise yourself. Uh, there, is a, there is a learning curve. I, I'd be honest with you out there. Mm. There are times when you are a bit uh, uh, hesitant or a bit even nervous. Uh, but then, you know, you do it once, you do it twice, you slowly uh, grow over it. So, uh, you know, to, to stand up there, to uh, reason with people, to make a speech, uh, even sometimes, uh, you know, uh, because in bureaucracy, uh, until really uh, uh, the Prime Minister, that is 2014, Prime Minister Modi's comment, mostly people were used to speaking in English. Mm. So, so there was a language bit, there was a subject bit, there was a, environment but there's, there's a different culture also you know? as your skills as a diplomat uh, it's I guess it would have equipped you to win friends over easily isn't it I don't think it's so much a question of winning friends uh, uh, I mean yes uh, the the 
it it does help when you're a diplomat you you in a sense are almost trained i would say mm. uh, to 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 get along to to um, uh, you know uh, uh, get the most out of situations uh, some of it is also different people are made different different mm. ways you know uh, uh, i mean you would see i very rarely get into anything personal with people uh, even when i'm provoked at times uh, i i think people are just made made different ways but uh, i would say this i mean it's now it's now uh, it will be four years four this years. summer uh, it's been a very very interesting four years i'm happy to talk with you later later mm-hmm. on about it but when i when i look at these four years for me actually it's been four years of very intense learning you know uh go, going to a state which uh, i had really very little knowledge of i'd been gujarat. a few times yeah. gujarat you know uh, uh then having a particular area as you know as an mp you work on on you work in on a village or in a in a particular constituency so all of these were learnings and mm. uh, i find it very interesting i find every day is a new day i i'm as you can see quite enthusiastic about it Yeah, you know when uh, Mr. Modi picked uh, uh, you to be part of his cabinet and such an important portfolio, everybody thought that you know you'd be like a technocrat or somebody like you know you bring domain expertise and you will be you'll kind of restrict your uh, karma into that region. Mm-hmm. But then uh, once saw you know you evolved, you became like a like any BJP karyakarta, like any BJP worker. You're you're part of the party. You take the party line. You go to all states not just gujarat you're going to karnataka you go to tamil nadu i've seen you going everywhere and uh, speaking about the party it's become part of your uh, the the political part has also become part of your making now uh, well uh, um you know for me it's interesting that's how it seems to you but look uh, one uh, this government this cabinet is very much a team cabinet okay mm. uh so uh you don't do your own thing out here you know you may have a background you may come from a stream but this very idea that you know you will do your domain as you say be a technocrat i, I don't think mm. it gels with what is this cabinet secondly uh when i was selected as a as a minister i was not a member of parliament i was not a member of a political party either i had the choice or whether i would uh, join a political party or not there was no compulsion on it nobody brought up that subject uh, it was something which which was uh, uh, left to me i joined because uh, one you know uh, when you are uh, joining a team you join it wholeheartedly uh, that is where you give your best performance and where you get the best support and secondly i i really reflected on on uh, you know what is what is the meaning of of actually joining a political party it's not a decision i took lightly and as someone who's studied and analyzed politics all their life uh, it it was something for me of of uh, great uh, importance so i joined because i genuinely believe today that this is a party which captures the sentiments and in- interests and aspirations of india uh, the best uh and i get into other issues because again one of the differences you know moving from bureaucracy from a department or a service into politics you learn so much more when you are a member of the cabinet you know your exposure every cabinet meeting you know there are let's say 10 items the you know it could be on agriculture could be on infrastructure but you you get you get a cabinet note you read the note you are interested you will you will study a little bit more so you actually your your interest broaden and if your interest broaden when you go out there and speak to people it will show up is there any difference in how uh, dr jay shankar the diplomat thought and operated and how dr jay shankar the external affairs minister politician bjp worker thinks and operates you know uh, see <laughs> in a way it's like uh, different lives you know mm. uh, now you you got to understand the challenge that uh, it was for me personally because uh, i am from a bureaucratic family you know 
my uh, my father was a bureaucrat i have elder brother who was a bureaucrat my grandfather was a bureaucrat and we have aunts and uh, not aunts but uncles uh, uh, who were who were uh, there so our world if i can put it to you this way was very very bureaucratic our goals our dreams were bureaucratic what I do mean, you mean by that meaning you know if you had asked me uh if you and i had met which we had mm. uh, let us say in 20 uh, 2010 mm. and say okay uh, jashankar what's your dream i said i want to become foreign secretary that's the dream of any foreign service officer in in our house it was also particularly uh, you know it was something we put no, a great no you never said that no because you, know, that you never in, asked me I, I, it uh, was in 1993 i think that i first yeah, met you you you, <laughs> never no, no, hang on. you you never asked me that bluntly but <laughs> had you asked me that look yeah it's a reasonable dream to have i mean after all when you uh, i mean if you, if you start a business or you do something you want to be the best in it right yeah huh? okay. okay i mean there's nothing wrong with that sure so fine i wanted to be the best foreign service officer and to my mind the definition of the best that you could do was to end up as a foreign secretary now in our household there was also i would say i won't call it pressure but we were all very very conscious of the fact that uh, my father who was a bureaucrat had become a secretary but he was removed uh, from his secretaryship you know uh, uh, he was uh, he became well, at that time probably the youngest secretary in the janta government in 1979 uh, for viewers and listeners who don't know uh, dr jay shankar's father was dr k subramaniam who played a key role uh, in formulating india's strategic doctrine sorry for interrupting yeah. you so in 1980 hmm. uh, he was secretary of defense production in 1980 uh, when uh, indira gandhi was reelected he was the first secretary that she removed and you know he was by i mean he was the most knowledgeable person everybody would say on defense Uh, he was also a very upright person maybe that caused a problem i don't know but the fact was as a person he saw his own bureaucratic career in bureaucracy actually kind of uh, stall hmm. and after that uh, you know he never became a secretary again he was superseded during the rajiv gandhi period for his uh, uh, you know somebody junior to him became cabinet secretary uh, so it was something he felt we rarely spoke about it but it was obviously something which uh, which must have uh, mm. been inside him so he was very very proud when my elder brother became secretary mm. uh, and uh, 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 in my case uh, he he passed away in 2011 uh, at that time i had got what you would call grade 1 which is like a secretary mm. rank ambassador i didn't become secretary i became after he passed away but for us you know at that time the like the the goal you could say was okay we must become secretary mm. now as i said i had achieved that goal mm. so in 2018 i was very happy to kind of walk away into the sunset uh, i ended up finally walking not into the sunset but into tata sans mm. Uh, and uh, you know i was i think contributing my fair bit there uh, i liked them i think they liked me uh, and uh, then completely as a bolt out of blue the the political uh, opportunity came now the the political opportunity uh, for me was something i needed to think about you know because i was i was simply not prepared for it so i did reflect on it briefly due to the pressures of time mm-hmm. at that time uh and uh, when you say what is the difference between the the foreign secretary or the bureaucrat jay shankar and, and the, the minister thought process, uh, the, yeah. the, it's a different world it's a different responsibility it's a wider vision and uh, you know i i put it to people like this i may have sat 40 years in the parliament gallery it's not the same as being on the parliament floor uh i used to sometimes in fact uh, you know uh, shishma swaraj was my minister mm. and Uh, as foreign secretary we used mm. to talk a lot i mean every mo- we had this practice we used to have long i mean i'd go and see her every day but of course they would begin by her actually calling every morning and uh, uh, i always had the comfort as a secretary and if i i don't want this to sound immodest i was a confident secretary mm. i believe i was a good secretary but i had the 
confidence that I have a minister and a prime minister above me who at the end of the day shoulder that political responsibility. Now, come May 2019, that political responsibility is mine. It's a completely different feeling. Mm -hmm. As a minister, you have to look at it not departmentally. Mm -hmm. You know, there may be something, uh, let us say, uh, which is, uh, I'm, I'm giving you an example. Say wheat export to some country. As a, as a secretary, I would say, you know, that country's relationship is very important. But as a minister, I'll have to say, okay, what's my own wheat prices looking like? What are the domestic uh, uh, concerns out there? Uh, who, you know, who else do we need to talk to? Every issue, hmm. every major issue has some political angle, sure. which a minister will tend to see much faster hmm. than a bureaucrat. However good that bureaucrat may be. So it's kind of challenging? Yes, absolutely. It is. Okay, so um, I don't know whether you'll answer this question, but I will ask you that who uh, asked you? Was it the Prime Minister? And uh, two, uh, the, what, what was the first time that you met Mr. Modi and what did you? What were your first takeaway of that meeting? Uh, the uh, Who asked me, meaning who asked me to join, to the, join cabinet? the government? Yes, yeah. the Prime Minister asked Prime me. Minister. Okay. Uh, when did I meet Mr. Modi first? I met him in 2011, in November. Uh, in Beijing, um, I never met him before. Oh, he was chief minister then. He, was chief then. Minister then. Okay. he had come on a visit, hmm. uh, and uh, that's how our acquaintance uh, started. Uh, uh, I assume, in the light of later events, I must have made a good impression. Hmm. I can tell you, he may, frankly, he made a very big impression on me because I, you know, by by 2011, I had already. Uh, done uh, uh, I mean I had done what uh, two uh, ambassadorial uh, postings already no right? this was my third third one third. yeah uh, and I'd seen so Singapore you know, and Czech Czech so I'd seen you know people come and go achievements I had never met someone better prepared better uh, more serious uh, and also more I found him very interesting you know I, I give you a and this is a person by the way we are meeting here for the first time hmm. So uh, he, we go through this business briefing, you know, what he should say, who he's meeting, etc. Then he said that, I want to talk a briefing Which was a bit of a surprise. No chief minister had done that. And of course, he told me, I mentioned it in one piece I've written, saying, look, it's very important for me that I'm abroad. I may be from a different party. But I shouldn't say or do anything which is different, you know, that too in a country like China. So uh, it should, uh, it's very, you know, I want you to brief me mm. on on key issues. And we were having our problems at that time. Even at that time, there was a listing problem. Uh, there was staple visas problem. They were not dealing with our northern command. There were, you know, all these Arunachal. There was some Gujarati diamond. Uh, yes, that, uh, there was a bunch of uh, Gujarati uh, Surat uh, diamond traders who had also been detained. And he mm. brought that up as well. Yeah. The uh, after I uh, did, you know was hmm. done with him and we went for the meetings and then we were riding in the same car. So he said, you know, I have this habit. Uh, he said, my har meeting ke baad mein debrief leta hu. Or agar apko kahin kuch lagta hai ki things are not okay, aap ishara kariye. Hmm. Okay. So I I remember this because you know for me. There is a certain manner of working which he has, you know. He's all the time like gauging, uh, sensing, very, very uh, sensitive to, to, to this. Very keen that he should not make a mistake, that he should convey things accurately, that the policy, that the nuances are captured. This was my first uh, experience uh, mm. of him. After that, I didn't see him till he became prime minister. Okay. Is it the same now, before he travels, after he travels, when you travel? Is it the same kind of thing, foreign policy matters, you talk to each other, where he asks questions, you answer, you ask questions, he answers? Is that how it works? It's No, you, uh, it is and it isn't. I mean, uh, uh, sort of uh, intrinsically it is the same, but it's now on a totally different scale and leak. Sure. So... Uh, 
uh, now what happens is usually you know we would strategize before you know we spend uh, i mean usually i'd say even not at the beginning of the year but even in the previous year we start thinking you know what should we be doing where are we going who should we engage that kind of strategy session uh, when it comes to something specific hmm. you know uh, uh it would it would uh, uh it would be like he would we would go through the details of where we are going hmm. you know what are the objectives who are we meeting what are their objectives so hmm. there's a there's a kind of uh, uh, i would say uh, strategizing and a uh, and a, a game planning which goes uh, well ahead and then it's repeatedly visited reviewed uh, so uh, so sometimes uh, even in the midst of meetings you would see us you know one of us lean across uh, and say something to him or him doing the same or if there's a break in a meeting you know we would have a quick confabulation i mean you you could i mean since ai mm-hmm. films lot of yeah. this you would often see you know there's a quick huddle yeah. where, where you quickly saying something we are updating or he's sharing hmm. uh his you know um uh we can't hear though because there's no, no fortunate <laughs> uh, thank god you can't hear because yeah. you know that would kind of destroy our uh, uh strategizing we uh, should get somebody to mm, see the lip syncing and yeah. see what's happening there but uh, but uh, the he's very he's a very discussive person if you know what okay. i mean hmm. uh, and he has views uh, but he's very open to you know opinion agreement disagreement improvement mitigation it's it's very it's very so yeah. how do i say you know yeah. interactive a, lots of people say that he's he's a very ideas kind of a man in fact uh, you know uh, uh, some of the questions were uh, on youtube with that and uh, my team has made a uh, a video which i'm going to show I'm, it to you i'm part of the east i'm part of the south i'm part of the west i'm universal <laughs> i'm india someone to say i'm doing this because it is for counter terrorism you know you're not fooling anybody by saying this thing mr soros is a uh old rich opinionated person if i could only stop at old rich and opinionated i would put it away but he is old rich opinionated and dangerous you know somewhere europe has to grow out of the mindset that europe's problems are the world's problems but the world's problems are not europe's problems our total purchases for the month would be less than what europe does in an afternoon i don't think we're sitting on the fence just because i don't agree with you uh, doesn't make me sitting on the fence it means i'm sitting on my ground i'm entitled to have my own side i'm entitled to weigh my own interests make my own choices you're asking the wrong minister when you say how long will we do this because it is the ministers of pakistan who will tell you how long pakistan intends to practice terrorism if you have snakes in your backyard you can't expect them to bite only your neighbors eventually they will bite the people who keep them in the backyard if i were to take europe collectively which has been singularly silent on many things which were happening for example in asia you could ask why would anybody in asia trust europe on anything at all if you are asking me i would say yes 2014 was a watershed moment yes things have changed better after 2014 yes our foreign policy has become more dynamic more effective more prominent after 2014 mr modi was very famous and uh, very demanding so how do you deal with that i'm so glad you chose that understated word demanding uh, so uh, yes i i think the prime minister is demanding i think is rightly demanding because it's time that india had a demanding person as prime minister it's tough to work for a demanding boss but at the end of the day you actually if you feel that's the kind of person the country needs i think you are willing to do whatever you have to do at that time two democracies will end it differently and if you can prove that concept here then i think is probably the best way to sell democracy don't worry senator one democracy will settle it and you know which one Mm-hmm. Okay. Lindsay Graham. <laughs> so this <All> right. <laughs> So this this is what we uh, you know my team got this together. Okay. And uh 
the same thing about being a demanding prime minister they one is heard about how you have 11 pm meetings and 11:30 midnight post midnight meetings happen with in this cabinet uh, and it's it's like working and especially during covid times when these crises happened mm-hmm. the ukraine mm-hmm. situation where uh, indian students had to be evacuated those are like very tense times right and it's it's he's on the job all the time uh well look uh i don't want you to get it wrong it's not like you particularly want to meet or the meetings happen at 11 o'clock or late at mm. night kind of thing i think it's a situation it's partly the prime minister's schedule i mean you mentioned for example uh, the ukraine uh, conflict operation ganga now what was happening at that time was that uh, the uh, prime minister was busy campaigning in up if you remember at that yeah. time now last year same time yep now 24th uh, of february I yeah think. a little bit later yeah 20 okay. huh. uh now it could have been i don't know maybe some other prime minister would have said okay guys i'm busy with up now you go manage this uh, but uh, i think it bothered him it he felt he needed to to uh, to get a good sense i mean lives were at stake so we would have situations where he would campaign the whole day come back to Delhi. I mean, you could see the sometimes, you know, how exhausted he was, and then somewhere he would find that energy and the I don't know the adrenaline, uh, and uh, we you know we would meet late because he's come back late from campaigning. Mm. Sometimes the situation would would uh, call for it. I would. Uh, I I think I once mentioned this maybe in one of those same occasions you showed me right now, mm. where. Uh, which was our consulate in mazar e sharif being attacked and i i remember it was i think it was past midnight and uh, i i also have this habit of staying up late and i i like to clear my desk every day without fail and uh, in fact he called up and normally you know some some other guy comes up and sort of says the pm wants to talk to you in this case it was him uh, and so i think if there is something happens he he feels you know mm. he feels deeply about it he, mm. he sort of feels mm. it's not like ask somebody to do something he wants to know that it's being done now mind you having said that i uh, i also um, uh, say this as his working style that once an objective is achieved or uh, a mission is set or whatever it is he then you get the space to then carry it out okay you know mm. so say operation ganga i mean he would want to know what we were doing uh he would sometimes give suggestions saying acha aap ye kabhi iske bare mein socha kabhi iska bhi dekhiyega wahan bhi ye kare but it was not like uh, yeah. he was wanting to you know get down he trusted you okay w- with with the details and that's why i mean for me the the uh, the sort of i would say the pleasure of working with him i mean what do you need from what does anybody need from a boss you need from a boss somebody who gives you a a goal with clarity who whatever their thoughts ideas etc share then if you are the experience operational person you know you leave them to to yeah figure out how it is done you take your feedback you might want to course correct huh but he gives you a lot of the space and which is why i think if you look at the last 7 8 years of uh, indian foreign policy we are able to move uh, i mean i i give you uh, why operation ganga i'll give you operation dost right mm. now yeah turkey you know, yes turkey uh, the earthquake uh, happened i mean uh, i think literally you know in a very very short time uh, you know uh, he wanted to know what are our thoughts i kind of sent in our thoughts i very quickly consulted uh, you know my own people in my own ministry and uh, literally within a few minutes we were told okay you got the go now you know go to, you know talk to ndrf uh, whatever yeah, tell the yeah in 48 air, hours if uh, i'm not mistaken that they were already there we were less less than 48 less than 48 okay less than 48 hours yeah you know um you were talking about delegation and about getting uh, things in order quickly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um 
we've seen videos of the cabinet committee on security ccs meetings you know it looks like this is the creme de la creme of the cabinet everybody getting together very serious looking very tough mm-hmm. and you you all look like you know bahut pahad toot pada hai kuch hone wala hai kuch bada what happens in these meetings uh, you know we saw that uri balakot pulwama uh, ganga operation ganga um, we saw this with during covid times with how do these meetings takes take place what happens does everybody input output what happens there no it would vary you see uh, uh, if there's a larger meeting usually there would be some kind of briefer hmm. uh, in any meeting because somebody has to put the proposition uh, and then uh, you know hmm. ob- obviously then uh, the the uh, floor kind of gets opened up uh typically uh, the prime minister comes in sort of uh, uh late i would say i mean he allows people hmm. uh to to speak before he actually uh, says anything that would be a a, a norm uh, we may look very serious because usually when ccs meets it's a serious matter hmm. you know uh, the uh, the routine ccs meeting we have you know wah, yeah, wah, sure. uh, if there is some uh um, something which uh, some agreement or uh, purchase or something needs to be cleared often you don't get the photo of it because you yeah, you, you yourself yeah. would not be yeah. uh, covering it so uh, you would not most of the pictures you do have would be of uh, occasions like uri or post kalwan uh, you know where where the situation is serious and i think it's obviously reflected on yeah. our on because our, there's no briefing after uh, the ccs uh, we never get to know what happened yes but you look uh, i i think uh, governments at the end of the day are supposed to focus on governance mm. so so if you if you have i mean if there are decisions you made which need to be executed you're not going to come and tell the press guys we just made this decision and that is how it is yeah. going to be executed okay so now uh, let me come to uh, you know when we were talking about how you do your briefings to the prime minister you do your briefings to the cabinet um what happens when you're at, with parliamentary uh, committees there is the opposition also out there Par- parliament or in parliament but the parliamentary committees there are opposition members also right the parliamentary committee on foreign affairs oh okay consultative committee consultative committee yeah, sure, sure. right so there are there are people from the opposition also in that sure. so how how do you how do you convince them about policy matters well i i you know uh, i have uh, only experience uh, of my own committee because uh, both uh, as foreign secretary and as em i've dealt with them uh, the way i deal with them is uh, we take a subject uh, we tell them this is a subject normally we take something very topical uh, and then we would have uh, again a presenter uh, often it would be the foreign secretary could be some other secretary normally not then i open it and uh, uh encourage everybody to to have their say and then what would happen is in some cases the presenter may respond but i would as a minister uh, sort of uh, uh uh respond to every one of the comments uh, which are made by every one of the members okay. uh, so my intent of doing that is really one to underline to them that we take them seriously uh, to not them seriously but their concerns seriously uh, to it does help in in kind of carrying them along and uh, sometimes in convincing them though politics is politics so sometimes whether they're convinced or not they would not they admit could, it uh, yeah. rahul gandhi didn't get convinced by you he in fact he said that uh, i think you were he i don't know the exact words but i think he said that you did not uh, no much about foreign policy matters you needed to learn a little more uh well let me let me put it to you more accurately this wasn't at a parliamentary committee mm. uh abit in parliamentary committees we have interacted but usually what happens in parliamentary committee i try to keep to myself so i will not get into it with you either uh this i think was something he said at some kind of public meeting mm. somewhere it was that you don't know much about i think he Uh, look i i cannot vouch for the exact words either but uh, i think it was probably in the context of china hmm, if china. i remember right yeah he's not convinced uh, about china yeah, that but you know i mean he thinks look, that you are what, opaque about it 
uh, uh, I don't know whether it's opaque or whether uh, you know uh, there was a sort of a level of knowledge understanding. I mean, all I can say in my defenses, I have been the longest serving ambassador in China. I have been uh, dealing with a lot of these border issues for a very very long time. Mm. Uh, I uh, uh, I would say. Uh, let me put it to you this way i'm not suggesting i'm the necessarily the most knowledgeable person but i would uh, have a fairly good self opinion of my understanding of what is out there okay but you know i'm i mean if he has uh, superior knowledge wisdom i'm always, as i said for me life is a learning process superior knowledge wisdom on china if he has i'm always willing to listen okay and learn from mr rahul gandhi on china if you think that that's a possibility uh, i okay. have never closed my mind to anything however improbable it is <laughs> okay yeah. all right um four years as foreign uh, minister of india and ninth year of the modi foreign policy mm -hmm. uh, what is the report card like i think it's a it's a very solid report card uh number 1 it's a if you look today at our global standing which is a very intangible measure of success but it's a very visible measure of success you know you you ask yourself uh, 2023 you know when a prime minister of india in this case narendra modi you know convenes a meeting walks up on a global stage how or a conference how do people react what compare it with even with him 5 years ago hmm. uh, perhaps with his predecessors many of them i would say today our global standing uh, is clearly very much higher hmm. is is uh, uh, quite good quite strong uh, number 2 uh, uh, strategically uh, i think there is today much greater clarity in our own thinking and in our own operations and i say that as an implementer of foreign policy that you know uh, people know there's a neighborhood first neighborhood first means build your connectivity and your contacts and this is your first priority then they know there's an extended neighborhood to the west towards the gulf to the east asean to the south sagar central asia there's a set of policies which do that then they know there's a policy of engaging the major powers uh, they know there's a africa focus so there is today a lot of uh, strategic uh, clarity about our strategy and that's necessary if you are serious about operationalizing it third in terms of operationalizing it you, you know uh, we we do today projects uh, in in almost 80 countries in the world it's you know most indians don't realize how much we do abroad uh, today and those are often the test of our credibility and there's been a huge improvement there that projects which would often lie for years mm. uh, you know unfinished uh, struggling for something the the efficiency of that uh, has improved uh, on big global issues today uh, uh, i think uh, uh, the expectation is that uh, india would have a say they would uh, ha have a voice they would have a opinion uh, and they would uh, if necessary Uh, you know uh, have more than that uh, and this could be climate change it could be counter terrorism could be black money i mean you look at the at the big it could be something like maritime security uh, even today trade investment uh, that domain technology uh, then i would also you know point to the fact that uh, we have been able to uh, to Uh, very clearly demonstrate to the world that we are a exceptional international power meaning we are willing to do things for others perhaps more than most other countries are at this point of time one is this sort of first responder record we have built up turkey is the latest that if something happens if it is reasonable if it is within the realm of possibility you know india is there early india operation maitri also and uh, maitri yeah. uh, operation uh, you know i i i can give you so many, a, yes. a, a whole whole uh, list uh, list of these you know uh, rahat in yemen yeah. uh, sankat mochan in sudan uh, 
but the covid vaccine yeah, is something no, no, that no no i was coming everybody. i was coming to that yeah. those are those are one country or one region yeah. or one situation if you ask me a single thing we have done uh, in the last 10 years which has shaped uh, global views about us uh, i think it is vaccine matter yeah that uh, the the you know it's almost uh, uh, i would say not it it's uh, almost emotional to hear what people come and tell you uh, Uh, about that and yet there was uh. criticism at that time if you remember dr jay shankar because people said you haven't managed to or we haven't managed to vaccinate all of our population and here we were sending vaccines abroad there was a lot of criticism then i i don't know if there was a lot because i think people domestically have, at least there no, was i i think there was loud criticism from the expected quarters mm. uh, i don't i would not consider it lot of criticism uh, you know it's very interesting in this country you would have people who when you do things say why are you doing it when you're not doing it say why are you not doing it if there's consistency the consistency is in opposition to anything you do okay uh the the fact is i think most people in this country understood uh, that you know it's the right thing to do and let me tell you uh, one thing when delta came delta wave came uh because it wasn't only the vaccines you know before that there was a hydroxychloroquine yeah. there was a paracetamol etc yeah. think how many countries did their bit to help us and some of them yeah. you know like say president biden the americans they said very clearly saying that look india helped us and we are going to help india mm. so uh, you know this very uh, sort of uh, short sighted view and sometimes as i said you know the people who claim to be internationalist suddenly become super nationalist hmm. you know uh, be, beware beware of such people because i am going to uh, come to yes, that yes. whether we are hypersensitive as a country uh, you know to criticism because uh, you saw that little video that i played uh, in which uh, george soros statement on democracy yeah, so, which so, you so, took so, on so, so. you took on and you you said that you know you said he was old rich opinionated no, no, and dangerous. i know what i said yeah. right yeah. now yeah. Th- there's also the the op-eds which come in foreign media which say that um that they blame india for now for crony ca- capitalism and say mr modi's image has got hurt the bjp on the other hand says that there's a there's a conspiracy uh, against uh, india rising india and uh, you know mr modi's muscular policies yeah, sure, and then sure, sure. it, it would be nicer to have a meek and submissive no, india look uh, smita uh, i have dealt with the world for a long time uh, i have dealt with the media for i even had a media job at one point of time okay i want you to step back don't think incident by incident they say this you know something happened you said this they said this the media said i don't want you to do that because it's you really losing the woods for the trees i want you to think step back and think the last 9 10 years okay what you have from different quarters is you know an episode there a decision here an adjective added here you know a photograph done there it's like drip 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 like water on stone they the whole idea is to shape your image you know your collective image shape it in a way in which you are made to look extremist you are made to look unreasonable you are made to uh, look as though you know you are not part of this what is otherwise a great good uh, progressive world okay now it happens in different ways you know every time we make a major decision you talk about us being hypersensitive i would put it to you look at the hypersensitivity of the of the media you know look how people jumped up and down when article 370 was was uh, you know uh, decided yeah. upon now or you know even even this example that you know uh, millions of people will lose their citizenship i mean and then see sometimes the dishonesty of the it. caa one that yeah, you're talking see about see the dishonesty of it you know you had reports and uh, you know i'm look i'm not personalizing it you know mm. i've got nothing against individual a or b or newspaper a or b but each one of them has contributed their bit okay 
you actually have people who would suggest problems in Assam are because of Narendra Modi. Now you and I know, I mean, come on, this is Indira Gandhi's time, okay? But that is whitewashed. You have people who say, oh, there's serious problem with judiciary because the there's an ex-chief justice who's now entered parliament. Is it for the first time? No, there was Ranganath Mishra did it earlier. So you know, our institutions come under attack. You know, suddenly I would, as I tell people, say what you will for me. You know, the to me the uh, the which one of us doubts our election commission? Which one of us goes to vote and thinks the the result is not what what is true and you know uh, uh, capturing the the integrity of the process? And yet, what will happen? You know, that comes under pressure. So there is an attempt, and it's a, it's a very very clever uh, attempt, and it takes different forms. You know. We had a very very tough time during COVID. So you but, are you saying it's all uh, coordinated? No, no, no. I think there is a mindset. I think the mindset. I would say there's an ideology. Uh, uh, the I, I give you the example of COVID. Okay, I grant you. We went through a horrible time in COVID. I mean, many of us lost people in our families, friends, acquaintances. Look at the coverage of our COVID. Did people not die in other countries? Did we see that coverage out there? Did you see that kind of photograph from other countries? I mean, you heard of bodies piled up in parking lots in other countries. Yeah. So I'm putting it to you this way. Look, I do think that one of the uh, uh, challenges today is you have due to, in my view, and mm. you know, you may or may not agree with it. Over 70, 75 years, what has happened is actually democracy has worked in this country. And the proof of democracy working in this country is cities, you know, uh, if you look, where is your leadership coming from? They are no longer the people necessarily from big cities and English speaking schools. Mm. Okay. They are people of a different background. And it's, again, I'm not talking individual here. I'm talking of a generalized uh, phenomenon. You look at the mindset of this society. This society today has become much more assured about what it believes in. There was a time when actually you kind of kept that as though, you know, uh, you're not supposed to talk about your cultural beliefs uh, in front of other people. So yeah. you actually have a huge Did change. Did you experience that when you were in JNU? Not talk about... <laughs> Indian you culture, know, you were, you know, Jane, that was in the hey, in the eighties, seventies, seventies, in the seventies. Yeah. Uh, you're diffident about your own culture. I mean, I I saw this comment in which you said one of the greatest diplomats that India has uh, was Lord Krishna, and there was Lord Hanuman. You mentioned him also, and uh, it's it's not something that is spoken about in diplomatic circles, and even in the media, who the beat journalists would never think of diplomats. And not even you, and you know, when when you think about it, your your background, your journalism, mm. I mean, sorry, your education. Mm, well, yes and no, because you know, I it's also a socialist. Had, no, hub. no, no. I also had a lot of home education. Okay. okay. Say, JNU was different. I was I was eighteen hmm. when I went to JNU. Okay. And JNU was very very firmly leftist hmm. at that time, uh, and I think uh, everything you know at eighteen, what you intuitively believe is either formed by your friends and acquaintances or what is reflective of your home. Uh, and uh, definitely in our home, my father, who was a very strong influence on us, uh, uh, was very distrustful of ideologies and people who he believed uh, were not, uh, uh, who did not have their loyalties uh, uh, in our own country. Such uh, as? Well, you look, you know, you are you're not talking, remember, he had his own uh, views about what was happening in the 40s and 50s hmm. uh, at that time, you know, who was for the national movement, uh, you know, where did uh, different people, uh, you know, how how did they switch? Remember at that time, China, there was a, there was a big China issue. Yeah. I mean, we, we are... Uh, oh, okay, we, you're talking yeah. the war and things. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, war, or post the revolution. war. Okay. Yeah. So, I... He, he particularly, I think, had, uh, he was very, very distrustful of the left, hmm. you know. 
so of the communist left hmm. huh? uh, and uh, uh, I think some of it so in a sense we grew up uh, very unspokenly but very strongly as very patriotic children hmm. uh, you, you might say you know we kind of went to uh, this uh, military uh, institutions I went to Air Force School to uh, King George's Bangalore Military School uh, my my uh, siblings went to uh, some of them went to uh, naval school to Sardar Patel uh, mm. Vidyalaya so mm. uh, I think that was the kind of mindset I took into JNU so in fact in JNU which was a dominantly leftist outlook where the teachers the students the administration everybody was very leftist my lot of people my cohort were the first set of people mm. who actually politically took on the left okay uh, and and actually uh, we had a meeting uh, we had an election even where uh, the then uh, uh, prakash karat was the was the uh, uh, sfi candidate he, uh, he won one election he lost one election so i you know i i where did you stand in that oh i was very clearly with what was called the free thinkers free thinkers so, yeah, free okay. thinkers was a assortment because other than the left there was no other political and there was uh, no tukre tukre in those days no no that see that all that came very much <laughs> yeah. very much uh, later mm. uh, so uh, i would say that sense of uh, 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 nationalism uh, uh, connection to country this was kind of instilled in us on the cultural question it was very interesting you know uh, when i did my book i have a chapter on the mahabharat uh, mm. in the book and uh, uh, one of the Delhi journalists asked me this question, said, you know, I find that a very surprising. Mm. Uh, I said, yeah, partly because you, maybe you don't know me that well. But we learned, all of us, um, I'm talking my siblings as well. We read Mahabharat very early. Uh, in fact, very often it was the subject of uh, discussion in our house of, uh, you know. And we approached, a lot of it was approached as strategy, as, you know, uh, uh, in a in a sense, uh, what our own epics and by the way, we were a very uh, I would say cosmopolitan household. It wasn't you know um, the you know the same father also gave us Iliad and Odyssey and uh, other things as well. Okay, so. so you had Homer on one side and you had the Mahabharat on the other side and a lot of things in between and, and a lot of, a lot of things. things. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm sure you had Plato, Plato and Aristotle too. I'm a political science student. Yes, I, I actually studied those. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So um, I'm going to come to this whole thing about the sensitivity issue. Do you feel that, you know, because many say that ban this and ban that. Uh, do you believe that that is a solution to it? Banning a documentary here, banning a book there, uh, asking a, a, a channel not to broadcast no, in no, India. No, no, no. Look, uh, I, 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 I don't think that you are asking the right question. I would... I would ask you, I'd ask you a counter question. What is it we are debating? We are not debating just a documentary or a speech that somebody gave in a European city or a, you know, a, New York. a, a newspaper uh, edit somewhere. We are debating mm. actually politics which is being conducted ostensibly as media, as... so. You know, you, there is a phrase, war by other means. Hmm. There is also, think of it, this is politics by another means. I mean, you'll do a hatchet job. Then you want, you want to do a hatchet job and say, well, you know, this is uh, uh, just another quest for truth which we decided after 20 years to put out at this time. So, uh, so I mean, come on, you think the timing, timing is accidental? I mean, let me tell you one thing. I don't know if you, election season has started in India and Delhi or not, but for sure it has started in London and New York. Hmm. Okay. So this is what it is that, you know, there's a lot that is say, being said that the rise of Mr. Modi and consequently the rise of India. These two things are happening at the same time, which is not acceptable to people in these Western capitals that you're talking and certain Indian quarters too. Do you agree with that point of view? I, think, I mean, do you doubt it? I'm asking you. No, I uh, look... Look who welcomes because it. Ashley who Tellis, are you know Ashley Tellis, right? Who are cheer leaders? No, no, let, no. Let me yeah. let me answer answer your question. You know what is happening is, 
just like i told you this drip 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 how do you shape a very extremist image of india of the government of the bjp of the prime minister huh? i mean this has been going on for a decade okay let's let's not uh, have uh, illusions about it how some of this has a different variant which is you will say something there's an echo chamber you will it will be picked up outside then you say aha see they are saying it outside that must be true then you will say it inside so there's a ding dong uh, going on see ha, look this is a globalized world people take that politics abroad politics of india doesn't stop at its borders sometimes politics of india doesn't even originate in its borders it comes from outside you know ideas come from outside agendas come from outside otherwise please tell me please tell me why suddenly uh, you know there's a surge of reports and you know uh, attention and and views i mean were some of these things not happening earlier i mean i i gave you the example of assam yeah i mean you people speak about okay you had to make a documentary many things happened in delhi in 1984 why didn't we see a documentary on that if if that was your concern that you son you know you felt suddenly one day okay i'm very humanistic and i must get justice for people uh, who have been done wrong so uh, so look don't don't kid yourself this is mm. politics at play this is at politics at play by people who do not have the courage to come into the political field they want to have the teflon cover saying that you know i'm an ngo i'm a media organization etc but they are playing politics you know so that i does, know that how does bjp react to this is it or your government for that matter is it reaction you know is it a reactory reactionary measure that you have to take how, how do you no, counter I, look, this i i think we will put our point of view across hmm. and as should be rightfully done in a democracy eventually the public will give its verdict which is the electorate that's why it's I mean. only by the ballot that these things if yeah. he gets reelected that means that they have been proven wrong is that it is that what you're saying look i i i would say yes among other things because in a democracy uh, i mean don't you trust the ballot box and the uh, people's verdict to be the final opinion i do i know there are some people who believe that their view supersedes uh, elections so in fact by the way i mean even that look look at this term i like you you win election great democracy i don't like you you win election what are you electoral autocracy yeah i heard that uh, term what what a great yeah. term right mm. that's reserved for people you don't like who win elections mm. so this is politics my dear so if there's so much money being going to be pumped in how does how does india react how does india even deal with it when you don't know that there's one enemy or this is no, amorphous no, entity no, look i i would say uh, it uh, i think there is, there should be and there is a battle for narratives which goes on uh, there will be narratives designed to damage us we have to put out narratives designed to expose people or designed to put our viewpoint across i think we will hmm. uh, my my own sense is that uh, most people will through their i mean they, you know this is a pretty informed age you know uh, mm-hmm. Uh, that that era when uh, people had only one or two sources and they controlled thinking hmm. i think that's gone by a long time ago let me come to the uh, foreign policy issues which i said we'll do in the second half of it you know um increasingly domestic issues and the foreign policy have become interlinked uh, foreign policy matters used to be something which uh, domain specific people handled it and foreign beat journalist demystified it for you but it's no longer the case and one saw it happening one during covid when everything everybody wanted to know why are we giving it to this country why not to that country how much are we giving do we have enough then there was the caa there was the farmers protest there was nupur there was so much that was happening uh, how do you deal with this it's like literally you know the you know that game that children play where you go on beating the things it was like that in that that two year period was really tough no no uh, 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 the uh, now i was smiling at the imagery you <laughs> you uh, invoked now look i the in a globalized era what happens is that everything from the world comes to india everything from india goes out in many ways it's a good thing it has its own challenges it has its own vulnerabilities so uh so how does it impact us that's really your question yeah 
what it does is uh, i have to often as part of my uh, narrative setting explain uh, explain uh, things to foreign audiences so i i i give you uh, an example take take this whole scare mongering that millions of people are going to lose citizenship hmm. now you tell people saying that look this was said now one year has passed two years has passed three years where are these people you know you this after all we are supposed to have a cataclysm uh, in 2020 so uh, and when you even citizenship when you start reasoning with people ask them saying okay tell me do you not have a criteria of citizenship do you do you not use language or some people use religion people use language they use religion uh, they use education some of them even use income uh, some use ethnicity so when you tell people saying look i reflect on your citizenship practice hmm. i mean what do you do so often what happens is uh, you know and and see that's where the battle of narratives is very powerful read the bulk of international papers especially the anglosphere papers but all of them how many of them tell you 370 was a temporary provision i challenge you to show me one you know yeah. they don't is written there in bold letters in capital letters in the constitution but then that's because india itself didn't put across that point of view no, right no. it's Hello, like the no, plebiscite no no, no, no so, it is true sorry sorry I, uh, we were listen i can put across something if you have shut your ears to it no amount of hammering away at it it's it, not see when when kashmir was being discussed pakistan used to keep saying plebiscite 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 till till the 90s that word plebiscite kept hammering it was you know that it is a disputed issue it till <laughs> india's narrative started being heard unless you are loud and you impose your narrative you don't get heard in the world no i i uh, completely uh, agree with you smita so i i try not to be loud i try to <laughs> get my narrative across in a elegant and uh, effective way uh, maybe at time sharper than people may want but uh, i i accept your point that we need to get our narrative across mm. and that is exactly what we are trying to do in foreign policy but i also put it to you sometimes that i feel that i'm talking to an audience which is deliberately deaf that they do not want to hear sometimes they do not want to absorb sometimes that and and there is a very strong bias i mean let's let's be frank about it you know newspapers there are newspapers i don't want to go into names who will publish something absolutely ridiculous on one side and you say okay i want to counter it they say no 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 hang on a moment i'm busy doing a fact check on what you are saying so we saw this bias very very clearly over the last uh, four years i think it in fact i expected to uh, if anything grow uh, as the election comes closer because i i don't think uh, you know this is without a political Uh, political political direction and purpose so domestic uh, politics playing a part domestic politics uh, hmm. you, you know uh, it could be domestic politics it could be covid it could be you know um, okay. it could be different big business uh, playing it, its part also it could it could be look i'm not a conspiracy theorist okay hmm. i'm uh, what i'm explaining to you is actually politics at work okay it doesn't have to be conspiracy at work Okay. but there are but why why is it uh, why is it difficult to uh, to understand that there are ideologies and political forces outside india very similar to those in india and the two are working hand in glove i mean i'm putting a perfectly common sense proposition before you and part of the problem is when political forces in india are not doing so well Uh, electorally they tend to kind of summon up this uh, this support system if you would or the echo chamber or call it what you would they are uh, the congress party is saying that uh, that in that the indian government is the modi government is defensive reactive when it comes to china that neither mr modi nor you even mention china you just say eastern neighbor hello uh, please then then they must have some problem understanding words beginning with a c please look at everything i've said hmm. that's not true 
And what about this thing that they say that uh, almost thousand square kilometers has gone and the foreign minister is not facing facts, not telling us the truth no, 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 in no. parliament? No, no. Look, uh, I, I, I think they are deliberately misrepresenting uh, the situation. I give you two very uh, specific examples of that. You remember that whole halla which happened on a bridge? You know, they were building a bridge in Pangongso. Yeah. When did that area actually come under Chinese control? Yeah, I've seen that. You said that it is long back. I'll tell you when it came. The Chinese first came there in 1958 and Chinese captured it in October 1962. Now, you're going to blame Modi government in 2023 for constructing a bridge with the Chinese capture in 1962? And you don't have the honesty to say that is where it happened. Or let me give you another example. You know, uh, these border villages. Now, there were border villages which have come up in areas which the Chinese actually, you know, in Longju, uh, there was a clash and uh, uh, it's not a secret, you know, at that time it was hotly debated in India, in the parliament, in the media. So, what happens? You do the smoke and mirrors, you know, say, oh, there is something happening here. It's almost like 1962 never happened. It is like, you know, we should be... Uh, I, I, let, let me give you a very, very... Uh, a different example. Everybody says, you know, we should be having our troops up there. We should be building border infrastructure. Hello, why didn't you build that border infrastructure? I just look at the budget of the border infrastructure. During the Modi period, the budget has gone up five times. You know... Till, till 2014, roughly it was 3,000, 4,000 crores was, was the budget. Today it is 14,000 crores. If you look at the, uh, the roads which are built, you look at the bridges that are built, they have doubled or tripled. You look at the tunnels which are taking place. I mean, this government is serious about border infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know the underlying thinking earlier was, you know, let's leave it like that, then the Chinese can't come inside which meant you had no intention of contesting them when they came. So, you know, I find it very thick that, uh, you know, look, I don't think, personally, I would get into a blame game. Hmm. You know, what happened in 62 happened. But if you now want to whitewash all that and say everything happened only in 2020, I, you know, I have to call you out, no? So you're fortifying the border, the boundary, uh, India-China, so, does that make China now the biggest threat to India? Are we in a state of of a quasi war like situation, no, conflict like situation? No, no, look, Where are we? No, no. I, I, I. First of all, I'm not using the word we are fortifying it. I think we are legitimately building our border infrastructure because they have built their border infrastructure. In my view, we should have done it 25 years ago. Again, we are reactive. That means. I mean, look, your words, no, no, Dr. Jai Shankar. no, no, not at all. Look, they are the bigger economy. Hmm. I mean, what am I going to do? As a smaller economy, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, go pick a fight with a bigger economy. Hmm. It's not a question of reactive, it's a question of having common sense. So, secondly, please bear in mind one thing. We had an agreement that you're not supposed to bring military to the, uh, uh, to the, to the border in large numbers. So, by that logic of yours, I should be the first to break the agreement. Why not? No, why, why, should, why should I? Because it doesn't make... Look, please understand... Why are we people. always no, the ones not breaking an agreement and it's always no, the other side no, breaking no, the no, agreement? No, Shweta, I, I, I think you need you need to uh, sort of take a very... Uh, okay, non-aggressive... No, 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 no. <laughs> considered view of this. Okay. We don't... Re why do we reach agreements? We reach agreements because it is in our interest to stabilize a border or a situation. Okay. It's not out of love and affection uh, and sentiment that you do. It's, it's cold calculation and common sense okay our agreements with china were reached in 1993 96 i'm not even getting into which government etc i mm. i think i try to avoid this this whole debate okay you know i don't like in foreign policy maybe it is because i've been myself so long in this field mm. i don't like to necessarily say these people were right and those people are wrong i don't don't think it serves the nation well okay but if i do find that others are playing a political game where everything is being blamed on the present dispensation and entire history is being whitewashed. I think the history has to come out. Okay. Now, on uh, the, the question of breaking 
the agreement or not breaking the agreement. Generally, countries as a rule, uh, sensible countries do not because what do you need most in international? If you have a reputation as a country which breaks agreement, what do you think is the worth of your agreement? That is China. Where have they kept the agreement with any country? No, no. Look, no, no. Hello. From, or Pakistan for that from, matter. From 1993, 1996. Okay, not a single 20, 20, bullet. No, no. Okay. No, forget bullet. From 93, 96 till 2020. Was that agreement observed or not? Hmm. So how can you say, you know, the agreement is not worth a piece of paper and nothing. All agreements must be They broken. took Aksai Chin. They f 1962. 62. Hmm. Between, they took Aksai Chin between 1958 and 1962. Okay. So if you didn't need agreements, why did you sign them? I mean, you went in 1988. I mean, Rajiv Gandhi went to Beijing in 1988. 88, correct. Okay. December. You signed agreements in 93, 96. I don't think signing those agreements was wrong. I, I disagree with you. Hmm. I mean, and this is not a political point I'm making. Okay. I think those agreements were signed because at that time we needed to stabilize the border. And they did stabilize the border. Please also note that. So this idea, suggestion of yours that people sign and compulsively break the next day, that's not true. Hmm. Now, why can't we not? Why can we not come to an agreement on where is the boundary? Where? How many rounds of talks? And it doesn't. It's non-conclusive. Because when uh, people are the the claims when any other country's claims are not reasonable, you will not come to agreement. I mean, you and I can come to an agreement if I make claims on you which are not reasonable, but you will concede it because twenty five rounds have happened. Hmm. You have to look at, you know, what is what is being discussed as well. No, right. So, okay. So look, uh, you know, if I were to sum up the China thing, I mean, please do not, you know, buy this this whole. Uh, I would say again, I use this word, this this narrative that somewhere government is on the defensive. You know, somewhere we are being accommodative. I mean, I ask people, if we were being accommodative, who sent the Indian Army to the LSE? Rahul Gandhi didn't send them. Narendra Modi sent them. Okay. We have today the largest peacetime deployment in our history on the China border. Okay. And we are keeping troops there at a huge cost with great effort. We have increased our infrastructure spending on the border five times in this comment. So now tell me who's the defensive accommodative person. In fact, the question you should ask is, Who's actually uh, telling the truth? Who's depicting things accurately? Who's playing uh, footsie with history? I think those are the questions which should be asked. Okay, let me go to uh, Pakistan. And there's a number of people who are now e expressing serious concern that here is a nuclear nation which is on the verge of an economic collapse. If that happens, it's in our neighborhood. Are we ready? The influx of uh, people who might come in into our country. How do we deal with this uh, situation where this country could collapse? No, I I think uh, you know uh, Pakistan's future uh, is largely determined by Pakistan's actions and by Pakistan's choices. I mean, nobody reaches uh, a difficult situation. Uh, sort of suddenly and without cause. So it is for them to find a way out. Uh, our relationship today uh, is not one, you know, where uh, we can be relevant directly to that process. Uh, if I were to, for example, compare it to Sri Lanka, I would say it's a very different relationship. Mm. With Sri Lanka still, there is a lot of goodwill in this country. Uh, there's, there's naturally a neighbor's uh, concerns and worry, but there's also a feeling, look, uh, you know, we have to help them to get through this. Uh, tomorrow, if something happens to some other neighbor, that would be the case as well. But, you know, uh, the you know what the sentiment in this country is about Pakistan. Yeah. You know, you were talking about these concentric circles when you said the neighborhood and then there's the second. Uh, one of the most dramatic achievements of your foreign policy has been... Uh, India's newfound status and reach out uh, to the to the UAE, to the Islamic world, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's been quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. When was that decision taken to reach out? Because otherwise, it all that one heard was that OIC has something to say on Kashmir. That was the maximum that one heard, even though there was this large Indian uh, people of Indian origin living in the Middle East. I would say, 
uh, I started hearing it first soon after I became foreign secretary. So it would have been early 2015. It is possible that the prime minister may have had some thoughts and discussed it with other people before I came back to Delhi. I can't, I can't uh, watch for it. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, if you were to ask me in 10 years, give me two, three examples of some big changes which have happened uh, in, our, in our policy, uh, I would certainly uh, put uh, our change relationship with the Gulf mm. uh, very, very high uh, up there on the list. Uh, why didn't it happen earlier? Uh, my own sense, if we want a very, very honest answer, is I don't think people were strategic earlier. Hmm. I think, they, you know, when you have a vote bank mentality, uh, you actually, you, you're not serious about foreign policy and uh, I would say operationalizing it. For you, it's like a slogan that they are with us or, you know, uh, so we kind of treated it as that's a place that, you know, the, the, we get our petrol uh, energy from there. There's a big community out there. And the rest of it was like a, like a, uh, like a distant, you know, uh, a goodwill uh, which you needed for your political vote bank calculations. I think when you got a different government which said we are, you know, we, we actually want something deeper, more strategic, with full elements, a full spectrum relationship. We have the ability today to deliver on a lot of issues of your concern as well. Uh, we are, you know, part of it, one of the reasons why the Gulf looks at us. The Gulf sees today's India as much more credible than the India of 10 years ago. And, you know, as they say... That's in spite of India having a right-wing government now. I would say... You know, that's that's why you need to think of this kind of labels. You ask people in the Gulf, do you prefer Prime Minister Narendra Modi or any of his predecessors? I'm willing to take a bet with you. Every one of the Gulf countries would say, I prefer the uh, Prime Minister Modi. Why? I think they think he's a more serious person. Uh, he's a person who makes, who's more credible, uh, who's, who's actually broad-based that relationship. Hmm. He's done more for the relationship than everybody else. And, you know, I, I must once, I, I tell you very honestly, uh, I, I was once at a conference in the Gulf and I had some friends hmm. from across the parliamentary hill with me. Hmm. And uh, this issue came up. And the person from the Gulf actually, and this was like maybe 2018, 19, he said, you know, these guys, he's looking at me, he said, they've done more in four years than you guys did in 40 that's the kind of image there is in that part of the world. Is Kashmir on the table now? It used to be, I know. Is yeah. Kashmir on the table when you deal with uh, countries in West Asia now? No, I, I, what do you mean on the table? Do they speak about it? Do they ask no. you about it? No. No, why would, I mean, look, Kashmir is part of India. I mean, that, that's it. That's that, it was always a part of India, but after the abrogation, there was a Pakistan had up the ante. Does that matter at all to these countries? No, it doesn't now? come up in any of my conversations. It doesn't come no. up. Okay, I'm going to go on to these new partnerships. Okay, <laughs> the new partnerships that are happening, you know, the Quad, the mm. I2U2, mm. India SEO, India ASEAN, all these which are happening, the opposition tends to say that though India is now partnering in all these groupings, where is it going? Is it just, it's are these just talk up. shop? It's, it's going well, it's going up. It's going good. So what's the problem? That that these are just talk shops and these are places where uh, nothing gets done actually. That India doesn't, uh, this whole thing about, you know, Vishwa Guru and things, where India is just posturing. No, 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 listen, the opposition has to say things, no? They are opposition. Hmm. Why, would, why would that be the basis for any serious question on your part? So where where are we headed in as far as G20 is concerned? Uh, it's become no, no, a people's movement. No, hang on, make up, make up your mind. G, are we talking G20? Are we talking All Quad? The, no, they're very different. So I 2 U two BRICS SEO. No, no. Look at the number of partnerships that we have now. Okay, ah, all right, very good. Let's stop there. Hmm. Why do we have so many partnerships? Answer: Because we get along with so many people. How are we able to manage? different kinds of partnerships. Maybe because we're good at it. Maybe because they see value in us. Are they delivering things? Well, it depends on them. Take Quad, for instance. 
definitely quad has delivered uh, on on a number of issues and likely to deliver on many more uh, in the case of i2u2 it has just started but already uh, there are projects on food security and renewable energy which have come out of it in some cases like brics which by the way was not started recently it has a yeah. old history uh, they are not meant to be necessarily translated into specific outcomes you know often they they express a, a, a collective position on a set of issues so i think it depends on on uh, uh, the forum concerned i think you can't club all of them uh, it's not a one size fits all hmm. uh, but uh, if uh, i I, d- i mean as i said the opposition will say what it will but you please go out there in the world i've just come back today from australia yeah. you know uh, people regard quad as probably the most uh, important foreign you know strategic foreign policy development uh, in the last 20 years yesterday you were in sydney i mean you just were in australia today you met with senator chakshuma uh-huh. uh, and there's this uh, whole talk that you know india has moved so close to the western bloc uh, that our position which was centrist with non alignment no longer exists is that over uh well people who say that must have been on a holiday through january when we had 120 countries mainly from the global south engaging us in what i think was probably the largest such exercise going on in the world and uh yes we have very good relations with the us uh generally with the west i don't think there's any reason for us to be defensive about it i think it's in national interest uh in fact uh, if you you know uh, if you look at the the big changes in the world uh, i this is something which uh, has been very much uh, in the making uh, especially in the last uh, decade but in all of this please see how how strongly our relationship with russia has held steady so uh, i mean surely you do not suggest that our relationship with russia is any the less uh, over these years so prime minister modi uh, said uh, uh, told uh, putin that you know this is not an era of war war is not going to be the solution uh, you know to problems do you feel that the world is seeing it like that about the ukraine crisis i think the world is still very divided hmm. mm, the sentiment that prime minister voiced uh, is a widely shared sentiment mm. it's also a sentiment which is particularly strong in the countries of the south you asked me what is the voice of global south you know yeah, what yeah. was that about look today you have a huge number of countries in africa and asia and central america latin america caribbean pacific who feel that our issues are being put on the side and the entire oxygen is being sucked up by the ukraine conflict so nobody is really worrying about whether i get food and what cost i get food what's happening to fuel uh, you know fertilizers uh, debt um, and today remember even middle income countries are going into debt hmm. okay so uh, the what we uh, want to do and i think that was very much on prime minister's mind he wants Uh, somewhere to create a momentum for peace if you would hmm? Hmm. and i think that was his first public expression remember he'd been talking to president putin and zelensky uh, on yeah. the phone as well and that was his first uh, public expression in practical ways we've been helping out you know when this black sea grain deal was done hmm. we did a little bit there to help when i was in um, in um, uh, new york the ukrainian prime minister hmm. uh, actually uh, had some concerns about the safety of the nuclear power plant so i spoke to rpm and then got his approval to uh, you know uh, to both engage the russians and pass on some messages there and the iaea uh, as well uh, we are working with the un secretary general uh, on some issues uh, particularly fertilizer because Uh, a lot of the uh, countries of the global south the developing countries they are facing serious fertilizer securities because russia is one of the biggest exporter uh, of fertilizers so uh, i don't you know uh, i think it would not be fair today to reduce a very complex issue the ukraine conflict to a you know binary of are you for are you on this side or that side are you for peace or for war 
uh, I think it's much more intricate than that. And we are involved in some of the intricacies. But we have to, you know, wait and see where this is, where this goes. Uh, you know, if, if the, you know, what, what both Ukraine and uh, Russia know is that uh, if we can be of any use, uh, we will uh, be willing, you know, our, our uh, sort of uh, uh, capabilities and um, uh, sort of goodwill uh, is there uh, for that. We'll have to wait and see where this goes. So has the war impacted on this, on the relationship between India and Russia no, and no, between no. Mr. Modi and Mr. Putin? No, no. I look, our relationship with Russia, I think, has been extraordinarily steady. Uh, it has been steady through all the turbulence in, in global politics. So, as I said again, you know, uh, the opposition, perhaps it's their job to criticize. It would be nice if they do it with a little bit more information and accuracy. Uh, uh, but uh, I I do think, you know, some of what they say needs to be put through some kind of lens, you know, some kind of filter of... Uh, yeah, you're putting it through a reality. sieve right now. Uh, the reality and uh, not very much is coming out of that <laughs> okay. sieve. Uh, right. so, so, look, I think today we are in a good position. I mean, we began, you asked me what is your nine-year report card. Uh, my relationship with the major powers is very good. I grant you that China is an exception. And it is an exception. And please notice, I said China, C-H-I-N-A. Okay, you uh, mentioned it. Yes. So, so I, I grant you that China is an exception. It is an exception because China has violated agreements that we have and is today uh, has a posture on our border for which I have to have a counter posture. Hmm. But overall, my relationship uh, with the Major powers, if you can call them, are very good. I think our relationship with Europe is probably the best ever that we've had. Uh, our relationship with in in the Quad, the Quad has really been uh, a very very uh, effective mechanism. Even in which uh, Australia, Dr. Jayashankar, there have been attacks on gurdwaras and temples in Australia, Canada, in, UK. In, on temples. On temples, mm. and in uh, in gurdwara in Canada, uh, there is a temple in Canada. Temple, temple in Canada. Canada. Okay. Yes. So. Uh, how are we going to react to this? Or no, we, we, have, we have taken up, we have taken the, we have taken this up, and we have, uh, uh, you know, cautioned these governments that you know these are very radical extremist forces at work, hmm. uh, and uh, that uh, they need to, uh, they need to, you know, respond to it appropriately. Okay. I, As I wind up, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Come back to you. Uh, you know, uh, you were in Fiji and at this uh, uh, Hindi conference and you were speaking Vish, in Hindi, Vishwa, Vishwa Hindi, Vishwa Hindu, Hindi, Hindi, Hindi Samelan. And so how many languages do you speak? You're a polyglot. I've heard you speak no, to no, Russian. No, 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 no. This, look, this is, this is all. Tamil, I'm, I'm Hindi, very, I'm very, English. very modest and realistic in making claims. Uh, uh, I, I, obviously I speak English. I, I speak Hindi. Uh, I won't say at a very high standard, but with a kind of a, uh, street smart fluency. The Tamilian uh, uh, Hindi, yeah. or is it a JNU Hindi? No, no, it's it's it actually a Delhi Hindi. Delhi. Hindi. I mean, I grew up in. I was born in Delhi. Hmm. Okay. You I, were born in Delhi. Yes, okay. I was born in Delhi. Hmm. I was born in Delhi. I grew up in Delhi. I spent, you know, most whatever time I've spent in India is largely Delhi. So it's a very Delhi person's, uh, I would say, uh, fluent, not always uh, complex uh, Hindi, but I I think. I'm, you're, very, uh, you're breaking the stereotype uh, of a Tamilian uh, speaking Hindi, fluent Hindi. You do speak. So, so uh, but you know, because I grew up in Hindi, I, I didn't have the advantage of ever studying Tamil. Uh, Tamil. I spent very few ah, years. You grew up in Delhi, so yeah, you speak. Uh, yeah, huh? in, in Delhi. Huh? I spent very, very few years in... But you can uh, speak Tamil. I can speak Tamil, but huh? uh, not with... Uh, not, uh, you know, with the kind of fluency and uh, command of vocabulary that I would like. Russian, which is un seems I believe. Russian is different because I actually studied Russian when I was in the foreign service. Hmm. We are allotted a language, huh. so I went there. So I actually properly studied it using books and so on. It's been many, many years, but uh, what uh, uh, I have a certain vocabulary and a very, very, uh, there's a, that residual memory. So once you go in there, uh, you know, it takes just a few days, but the you know the the vocabulary of foreign policy. Uh, if I were to watch, let us say, news, I'd be able to get a lot of that. 
Okay. Uh, if I were to be on the street, it'll take me longer because there'll be accent, you know, mm-hmm. more colloquial uh, stuff. Uh, I have a certain, uh, I would say, uh, working, a rudimentary sense of Japanese because I do need to talk to my wife from time to time. Okay. Right? Uh, so this multicultural yeah. uh, exchanges that you have at home, tell me about that. Japanese wife, Tamil husband. No, how does you know? Look, uh, what has happened is we've we've kind of evolved something which is peculiar to us, and mm. this happens, you know, mm. in this situation. I mean, it could be your food, it could be your slang language, you know, what you say to each other. I mean, we use phrases which somebody else listening in would find very difficult because they could be Japanese slang put in an English sentence, mm. sometimes with a Hindi twist. Because my wife, my wife's linguistic ability is much better than mine. Mm. Mm. So, uh, so we we sort of end up uh, with some kind of uh, I would say. Uh, uh, mish- she can speak mish- Hindi too a little bit. She, she speaks of. Hindi, but she huh. again picked it up without studying. Without studying. Yeah, without studying. Okay. So, I uh, my you know uh, I I learned uh, Hungarian, uh, but unfortunately it's very rusty because uh, uh, you the you know when you don't use a language it, reading it uh, ulta uh, no. No, 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 no. Hungarian is... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex language. Okay. Uh, so it's a Finno-Greek group. Hmm. So uh, so people make more claims about me than I do myself. I'm very, very... Uh, Everybody can, uh, wants to know, are yeah. you going to contest Lok Sabha polls in 2040, uh, 2024? Uh, I am a Sabha member. Hmm. Uh, my term expires this year. Hmm. After that... We'll have to see. No, no, don't give... You know, see this... I don't know how many... 25 years maybe I've heard these diplomatic answers from you and tried to no, find answers. Uh, no, no, look. Uh, on, on... Would the, you want to? Uh, on these things... You know, I, I tell you... Uh, I'm going back to your first question. I'm actually honestly in awe of people, of everybody, irrespective of party who have spent their lives in politics because you actually don't know how incredibly hard it is how demanding it is you know what how much it takes up not of your time but of your life you know the kind of effort that they put you know there are uh, no saturday sunday uh, holiday uh, morning night nothing and it's only when you are in politics that you can actually see uh, what it is and I would say those who particularly contest Lok Sabha they are like at the cutting edge hmm. cutting edge of that because it, it's a, it's a, it's an enormous demand but uh, most people on, would on think this. that it's a life of privilege Lal Bhatti Wali Gadi Latins no, no, Bangalore look, uh, I, I, I know that is the uh, that is the popular impression and I say this uh, you know uh, please do not think I'm saying it because I joined politics I'm saying it because actually I, I'm only now getting into political life and I'm getting into it uh, at a fairly ripe age uh, from, from an, another profession. Even I did not realize it till, you know, I would watch politicians, as I said. You know, mm. watching them, meeting them from time to time is very different. When you actually see the lives, live the life, you know, uh, the, the kind of travel they do, the kind of... Uh, openness of you know which you with which you have to uh, keep your activities going it's it's a huge, you're doing huge, that uh, in Rajya Sabha uh, yes. you're doing that as a Rajya Sabha MP uh, you're traveling a lot you're traveling within the country you're traveling no, no, but, outside but the look, country look I, it's not it's not a it's patch not on same. what what the others do I would because I I do spend uh, you know as a minister I have to spend a lot of time here as a Delhi person I have to spend a lot of time here you know the the Rajya Sabha demands are far less than the uh, Lok Sabha demands. Mm. So I I look at my honestly my colleagues and again this is a non-political. It's a non-partisan point. Mm. It's a political point. I actually marvel at at really you know how much of an effort people in politics have to make. It's a it's a very tough life. Right? You know just in conclusion when I talk about when you were saying non-partisan, uh, I must comment on this that when when you joined uh, the government, there are many uh, in my uh, friend circle, in my colleague circle who were like, 
why does dr jay shankar want to join politics why he's had such a sterling career in uh, in bureaucracy and many felt very let down when you joined politics that you know now you've chosen a party you represented just india but now you've chosen a political party and in 2014 there was a kind of a watershed moment and maybe even 2018 later 2019 too where even in you know it, mr modi brings that out in many people the people adore him and they are on you know like him a lot and on the other side they feel that no not him so when you chose to join the bjp you made that choice you moved away did you feel you lost friends at that stage or many people who moved away from you no look i as i said i gave it a lot of thought uh, remember i became minister at the end of uh, uh, may uh, i think i joined the party i can't remember the exact date but i must have thought about it roughly for about a month you know uh, i mean thought about it means not like every day thinking about it but i gave the matter thought uh, i i joined because my sense is that they are the right party uh, at the right time for india's uh, rise and progress because at the end of the day when you ask so what are you in it for you know uh after all which one of us would not like to say i also made some difference somewhere you know mm. the country went up and somewhere you can debate how much played a role huh? Huh. you played a role so uh, uh i as a you know i had no active desire to to join politics at all i mean to me as i said it came as a complete uh, surprise that the prime minister could even consider me uh, for for such a such a job and i became a minister before i kind of join, entered a yes. political party so i would be somewhat different from many other people hmm. you know who may have also been in bureaucracy before before they hmm. bend down that route uh, i do feel sometimes that you know uh, uh, the uh, the uh, argumentation the debate sometimes the relationships the civility uh, especially in delhi uh, is uh, is more polarized than it should be than it should be for the people concerned or for the good of the country but you know sometimes that is that is the way uh, it is you're a pakka uh, delhi boy you uh, also lived in washington dc uh, i think it was reagan right who said that if you want a friend in this truman truman who said, go, it, he said get, go a, get dog. a dog yes. go get a dog do you yeah. feel that about delhi too no 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 look i i i still uh, i do not get the time to socialize anymore uh, uh, i snatch you know uh, hello there and a cup of coffee here sort of thing but i i won't say that maybe i you know some of this are arguments with people i've known for a long time mm. so i i i i i know what you are saying i i know there are many people uh, who uh, you and i have both known for a long time yeah decades uh, uh, decades uh, who have political uh, preferences which are very yeah. uh, different from mine uh, but you know my my understanding of what Uh, our life in a democratic society is supposed to be is that you know uh, you you each have your your point i i don't necessarily build my friendships uh, on on party positions do the others do the same others meaning the others those same people who are unable to keep up with those friendships because of your political decision i i honestly don't know the answer i think that's something you have to ask them uh i mean i uh i i do accept that you know in the last few years there would be people who who whose political feelings are so strong hmm. that uh you know it may have uh, it may be coloring the vision of me but i would say at least my closest friends hmm. many of whom by the way are not bjp supporters or modi supporters uh, my really closest friends i have not seen that happen what is your day of like what, last question mm. when you want to chill when you want to relax what do you do um read a book music go for a meal no no what or, do you do, do? Or, or look i i i read a lot even otherwise i don't need yeah, you know because i, I i'm on a plane you know yeah. if you're on planes 
Uh, and you fly a, commercial. You yeah, don't I, even take a special yeah, aircraft. I, I fly commercial as far as I can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you're the old fashioned. You carry books. Yes, I carry books. You're not a Kindle person as yet, or you're not. You're not all that. Uh, you I, still carry those old fashioned. Yes, because you know I can. You know, books at least I'm old fashioned. I do watch movies. Hmm. Uh, I uh, usually download it on my. You know. So hmm. Oh, no, oh, I've no. never seen you watching a movie in a flight or you know chilling with a movie. I've always seen you with books. Uh, maybe we should fly yeah. more together. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank okay. you so much for All this right. conversation. Thank you. It was a pleasure.